And the reason I knew I was dying is because when my eyes were open, I could see everybody rushing around trying to save my life. And when my eyes were closed, I could also see everybody rushing around trying to save my life. But mm. I saw this most amazing thing. You know how we say there are no mistakes in the universe? I saw there were no mistakes in the universe because I saw that there was this divine light. It was like a celestial light mm -hmm. that was guiding the hands of the nurses and of the doctors wow. and making everything happen like the cogs on a fine tuned watch. For example, this uh, one nurse, she, she was hanging up an IV bag and she fumbled it and she dropped it on the gurney and everybody like gave her, da you know, shot daggers at her with their eyes like you clumsy fool, you know, this one is dying and you dropped mm -hmm. the IV bag. But I saw that when she bent down to pick it up, her head moved away from a monitor and another nurse across the room went oh, and went and made an adjustment that probably saved my life. Hi, I'm Tom McCarthy, and welcome to another episode of The Breakthrough Code. I am so thrilled to have one of my favorite people that I'm going to introduce you to today. And she's somebody that I haven't known forever, but just when I met her, I, I said something special about this lady. And it was back in January of this year, so not that long ago. So that's eight months ago or seven months ago, we met at a conference uh, or uh, a, a meeting of a group that we're both part of called the Transformational Leadership Council. And I don't even know how I got to sit next to her. Or we were at the, she was at a table and I sat down and we just started talking, but we hit it off and we become fast friends. And she's been very, very helpful to me. And so I know she's gonna be helpful to you too. Her name is De Deborah Poneman and she is, an amazing human being. She started as a transcendental meditation teacher, not just practicing it, but teaching it at 19 years old. So you can tell she's an elevated soul. She's a leader, someone ahead of her time. She started a company called Yes to Success that just took off. And it's amazing uh, when you look at people that are successful in the realm of teaching success and manifestation, not only has Deborah taught so many people how to do it and been a huge luminary in that field, but people that used to work for her are actually now best-selling authors. And so she's launched so many successful careers. And then finally, another thing that we're going to get into, and we'll do this towards the end. So we'll talk about success, manifestation, and Deborah's ways of helping people to do that. But take a look at her. She looks like she's maybe 35 years old, and I'll let her tell you her age uh, as we get going here, but she has a program called Ageless. She's figured out how to stop aging. Now, maybe not forever, but she's figured out how to do it, and so I definitely want to have her share some ideas with all of you on that, too. Deborah, thanks for being with us. It's really great to have you here. I cannot believe we've known each other for eight months. I feel like we've been BFFs for like... 18 years. It's that's crazy to me that we just met at the beginning of this year. Yeah. And and do you wanna I mentioned it, man, maybe we won't wait to the end. Do you want to tell people, and I know you're not shy about this, so you're not offended that I ask. You want to tell people how old you are? That's so funny. Well, actually, I'm going to be 72. Yeah. <laughs> Which is so absurd. You know, the whole thing is absurd. But actually, the reason why, after teaching success for decades, I started teaching. Ageless is because I'm not shy about people knowing my age. When I would say it, they would say, what are your secrets? There's yeah. no way you're, you know, 68, 69, 70. So I thought, you know what? Why don't I just teach a course? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I know the secrets. And, and then I called my friend who is a Harvard researcher. She does research on anti-aging. And that's when we put our ageless course together. And you said, as you said, yeah. at the end of our yeah, time. We'll talk about it. Yeah. 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 And also when you look at Deborah, it's not just the, her physical appearance where you see youth, you can feel it in her energy. And so this is a person with tremendous experience. She's launched not, not only so much success in the people that have attended her events, but as I said, like the people that came to work for her have become number one New York Times bestselling authors. And so she knows what it takes. So I hope you'll listen as we go through this because she can really teach you 
some things that can allow you to have an amazing life and you already have an amazing life, make it even more amazing. So Deborah, take us through how did, how the heck did you get started with transcendental meditation? Was that something your parents were doing or were you just one of those kids that was always different and tried things? Like, how did you get started with that? Okay. You're going to love this. You never heard this story. So I was going to school at the university of Illinois and I was 18 at the time. And, and, you know, I'm always truthful. So I'll tell you the truth. I saw a poster. It had an Indian guy with a beard and learn meditation. I thought, well, that would be like a cool thing to be a meditator. (laughs) (laughs) I started so I could be cool. Yeah. But you know, the first thing that happened was I stopped falling asleep in class. I had so much more energy and my mind was clearer. And then they said that you'd have a happier heart. And I remember my boyfriend, quote unquote, breaking my heart, but it wasn't, it was kind of like a line on water. It happened, but the recovery was so much different, quick, more quick because my nervous system was actually um, dealing with things differently. So it was not like a line on stone where it was painful every time I thought about it, but like a line on the water, like eh, it happened, move on. And it wasn't an intellectual thing. And that was why I decided to become a meditation teacher. And I did go to to, um, TM teacher training when I was 19. Yeah. Yeah. No, TM is great. I remember learning it, not as young as you, but in my twenties and, and it being very, very impactful, but I don't think it, 18 or 19, I was even thinking about that. So you were definitely way ahead of your time. That really is incredible. So you you went from being a TM teacher, you started a company called Yes, yes to Success. What year did you start that company? Well, that was 1980. So you want to hear the genesis? The sure, whole, the, yeah. The, um, what do they call it in a movie? The arc? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the arc is that I was a meditator for years, but you know, this is the early seventies and I um, noticed all of those benefits and I decided that I wanted everybody to get these benefits. So I became a TM teacher. I became the director of admissions at Maharishi International University in Fairfield, Iowa. And um, I taught thousands of people TM. And towards the end of the decade of the 70s, I had the realization that woman does not live by mantra alone because I was (laughs) freaking broke. Yeah. (laughs) And I thought, you know, I'm pushing 30 here and maybe I should have um, things like health insurance insurance, car insurance, or maybe like a car to insure, perhaps. Right, right. So I thought, you know what, where do people make money and how do they make money? So I looked out at the vast world and I thought, the people in California look really rich. <laughs> I'm going to move to California because I was living in Fairfield, Iowa, in this meditation community. I'm going to move to California and I'm going to sell investments because that's wow. how they appear to make money. So I moved to California. I started selling investments. I am a beyond a dismal failure. It was so not for me. But one night I was invited to the learning annex. Remember the learning annex? Yeah, I remember the learning annex, sure. So I'm invited to the learning annex. This is like 1980. And for a money seminar, and I walk in, I thought, you know, maybe it will help me be more successful at selling investments. And I walk in and the guy is not talking about investing. He's talking about the law of attraction. Right. And he was saying that if we want to be prosperous, what we have to do is we have to create a prosperous vibration. And he said, we're like tuning forks. And if you're always complaining, oh, I'm so poor, I'll never get out of debt, I'll never Mm -hmm. be rich. He said, no, put a vision in your mind of what you want to be like, no matter what your current situation is, and you'll start vibrating. And like a tuning fork will um, attract an E, will attract an E, but will repel a B flat. If you're thinking negative thoughts, you're going to repel prosperity. He told us to go down to Beverly Hills and walk down the street and look at the houses and the cars and say, that's for me. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Visualize ourselves. So again, this was like, what, 40 some years ago, but I I did it. And and also he said, in, in terms of a career, don't think about, okay, how can I make money? Think about what makes you happy. Yeah. And he said, go de- home if you don't know what your career should be and write down all those things that make you happy. So I wrote down, uh, talk, obviously mm-hmm. I like to talk, write, love to mm-hmm. write, be on TV, travel, 
contribute to people's lives, work with people that I love, laugh until I cry, cry until I laugh. I wrote down this whole thing and God's honest truth. The next morning I woke up, I actually woke up my husband. I said, my then husband, um, what, whatever his name was, Mark, his name was Mark. And I woke up, Mark, I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. He said, can't you just wait like an hour or two before you wake me up? I said, no, I'm going to teach it the world. Anyway. And and then I started studying the great masters of success and prosperity, like Napoleon Hill mm -hmm. and Wallace Waddles and Florence yeah. Scoville Shin. And I started devouring all of those books. And I learned, I, what I did was I just employed what I learned from them. And the main thing I learned was that an idea comes to you because you're the one that's supposed to manifest it. I love that. The universe wow. is right. Yeah. The universe isn't random. Mm. I mean, I didn't have the idea to write the breakthrough codes. The yeah. universe gave you that idea. Right. Somebody else. And also we have the skills. I don't have I never had the idea to become a concert pianist. I have no right. musical talent. I didn't have a, you know, the thought to start a company to produce you know, digital marketing products, mm -hmm. you know, you have to explain to me very slowly what a funnel is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We all have the ideas that we're supposed to manifest. And also they come to us at a time when the world needs that idea. Yeah. And I believe, you know, get a little God here. I believe God whispers that idea into your ear. When yeah. God or the, you know, the God of your understanding needs yeah. that for the world to work. So if you don't get going on it, that idea is going to go to someone else who will. And how many times I know I have, if you had an idea that you didn't act on, and then a few years later, somebody becomes very successful. You're like, that was my idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't act on it and the world needed it at that time. So I had the idea to start a success seminar company and I did it. Yeah. And 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 then tell us about that company. So it's called Yes to Success. Yes. It was successful right out of the shoot, which partly explains what, you know, or, or makes sense because of what you're talking about. Like that idea came to you to manifest. You already had the, you had the resources of the universal mind already working for you. I believe that we are connected to god you know the creator and so i believe we have that in us right we're meant to do those things but how the heck did you create so much success like right out of the shoot yeah and especially because the only thing i'd ever done in my entire life was teach meditation and right. fail at selling investments right i only sold one by the way and that was to my dad but <laughs> <laughs> well Again, I followed the principles that I was learning from these great masters. And one of the principles that I that I will not bend on this, even though people say, oh, I don't agree with that. When you have an idea that fills a need or answers a lack in society, don't go around telling everybody that idea. Mm. Because what's going to happen is, is you're going to run, well, two things. One is, you're going to run up against people who say, oh, that's a fabulous idea. You're the great person to do it. And you get all these accolades. And then you don't have as much impetus to actually make it happen because it's kind of like getting letting the steam out of the kettle. Every yeah. time you tell somebody what you're going to do and they say, oh, that's great. You know, there's not as much pressure to actually do it. Oh. So I say, keep the steam inside the kettle or keep the seeds yeah. underground where they're safe and warm. And the other thing that happens if you share your precious ideas is you're going to run up against the discouragement committee, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And they're going to tell you all the reasons why, oh, come on, all the world, the world does not need another podcast on leadership. Yeah. And the people who are doing it have so much more experience than you. And then your tiny seed yeah. idea is yeah. crushed. Yeah. So what is sacred should be kept secret and your precious ideas are sacred. And I'm saying this to your listeners. Mm -hmm. If you look back on those ideas that you had that you never manifested, I would bet, what does my, my ex-husband used to say? Dollars to donuts. <laughs> that you shared that with people too soon and they were the discouragement committee. And yeah. 
the other thing that I teach is don't wait until everything is perfectly in place. Right. Because you know this. People are, oh, I'll start my idea when yeah. the kids go to school, when I get, you know, the inheritance, when I get the divorce, when I met. No, we live in a relative universe and there are always going to be loose ends. So what you have to do is just force yourself to take a step from which there's no turning back. And in my case, because I was 29 years old, I had no experience. I mean, success. I drove a beat up Chevy Bel Air that my aunt had left me when she died. Right. I, I said I didn't have a car. But and I'm she, old, but I don't even know what a Bel Air is. What's a Bel Air? <laughs> It was my dad had a Chevy Bel Air in 1956. Yeah. And um, yeah, so, well, there you have it. So yeah. my aunt gave me this old beater and um, I was beyond broke. At least when I was yeah. working for the TM movement, I was just like broke. Now yeah. I was beyond broke and I was going to tell people how to be successful. But again, the idea came to me. Yeah. I studied, I knew the formula. I knew it from these great masters. So I, the step that I took from which there was no turning back is I rented a room at the Santa Monica Public Library and I start putting up posters. That's what we did in 1980. Yeah. You know, Deborah, my name at the time is Olson. Deborah, oh, I've had a couple of names. Deborah Olson <laughs> to teach how to be, you know, say yes to success. And as soon as the posters went up, the discouragement committee showed up and said, people are not going to believe a crazy idea like your thoughts create your reality. Yeah. But the posters were already up. So yeah. I couldn't turn back. Yeah. And, um, and sure enough, I went into that room at the Santa Monica Public Library and there was standing room only. And wow. that, yeah, sure That's enough, awesome. people were interested in yeah. the idea how to create the reality you desire yeah. Using the power of your mind. So let's talk about, well, let's talk about a couple of things, but around the concept of thoughts create your reality. I'm based my whole life on that, right? So that's something that, that I'm a huge believer in. Uh, people, when they, they hear that sometimes they're like, well, how come my reality? And I know what you know, I would say, and I'm pr pretty sure I know what you say. How come my reality is not that good, Right. What do you tell them? I know what I tell them. Well, first of all, the fact that your thoughts create your reality, excuse the expression, is no secret anymore. Yeah. I mean, the science, science is verifying it right or left. And if they say my reality isn't good, even though I'm thinking positive and I'm crazy, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> because vibrations don't lie. That's right. I mean. Your thoughts can actually make or break your physical health. Physical mm -hmm. health is so, we talked about this. Yeah, just it's, earlier we were talking about that. Exactly. Your physical health is a product of your mental health. And yeah. it's so much, I, can I share a little bit of research? Sure, yeah. Okay, so research has shown that the way we think and the way we speak about our physical bodies can not only increase our disease fighting white blood cells and mm -hmm. lower, you know, lower the level of the hormone that raises blood pressure and actually reverse heart disease. I mean, it, your thoughts can even strengthen your bones yeah. and grow brain cells. But um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa Eppel. She's a professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco. She conducted a study of 159 people who had just been diagnosed with HIV, mm. and they were randomly assigned exercises intended to foster optimism mm -hmm. and other positive emotions. I read this yeah. in the New York Times, and it said that people with new diagnoses of HIV infection who practice the skill of positive thinking, and they look for the good, and they look for the silver lining they carried a lower load of the HIV virus. They were less likely to need antidepressants to help them cope, cope with their yeah. illness. As compared with the people who just continued expressing negativity. Right. And it was the same results with people with advanced breast, breast cancer, diabetes, even people with dementia. And one other thing it said in this article, it said that these health benefits, it was discovered that positive thinking could actually slow the aging right. of the brain and the body. There is a study of more than 4,000 um, people 
uh, I think they were 50 years and older. And if they were optimistic about getting older instead of, oh, first my knees are going to go yeah. and then my eyes are going to go and then I'm going to get dementia. But the people who are optimistic about getting older had lower levels of C-reactive protein, which is the marker of stress-related inflammation that's yeah. associated with brain inflammation and heart disease. Yeah. And they live significantly longer. Yeah. So. No, I love it. Well, and the, and the challenge with uh, thoughts creating reality for most people is they are so locked into the 3D world and, and they think that, you know, how can a thought change something that's real, right? Something I can touch and feel, but their thoughts have created it. Thoughts have created everything we can touch and feel. That's where it started with some a thought. Even, you know, my computer monitor that I'm staring at today was not just created. It was a thought that that allowed somebody to create this or a team to be to, to create this. And you know, Einstein said your your imagination is preview of coming attractions. Your he said your imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is based upon everything you can see right now. But your imagination has no boundaries. Everything that, I mean, you know, you and I, when we when we grew up, we never thought we'd see one of these, right? A phone that wasn't attached to a wall or had a cord coming out of it. So it's real. Now, the other thing that I think holds people back is they go, okay, I'm going to think it. I'm going to think it. I thought it. Where is it, right? And And they don't take into account like all the other counter thoughts that they've had for so many years that they need to dump away. And because if you put good thoughts on, on a trash heap, it's going to be kind of hard for it to grow. So address maybe some of these things in your, your, you know, your teachings about uh, how people can stay the course with this when maybe the thing they're looking at right now is not what they want to see. You know, it's not the life they want to have. It's not the body that they want to have like how do you teach people to stay the course with thoughts create your reality well i will tell you that for 30 years i basically gave people all of the rational arguments about and even if they saw the movie what the bleep do you, do we know yeah. um they actually have scientific proof that we affect matter yeah. with thoughts. So I would give them all of this proof, proof, proof. And then I had a near death experience. Mm. And when I tell people this experience, it, I person after person after person who had been my student forever said that was what changed their thought. Yeah. Power of our thoughts. So can I share that with yeah, you? Yeah. I'd love to hear your nerd. Yeah. Because it's something we haven't talked about, but it's something I'm really interested in. Yeah. Yes. I can't believe I've never told you this before in our long eight month friendship. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I never get sick. And by yeah. the way, a little hint there, I always say I never get sick yeah. and I never get sick. Yeah. If you are going to expect like, oh, every time a bug comes around, it hops on me, you know, like stop yeah. it. Right. I don't even when there are people sitting around who are my age and they're all talking about all of their expectations <laughs> about aging, I get up and I leave. I go, you know what? <laughs> Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see you around. Anyway, um, so it was actually 2015 and I was still living in Chicago at the time and I got a little sore throat and I thought, oh, I never get sick. And I it took some echinacea. I took some golden seal, you know, drink some electrolytes, which is what I always do. And I always knock that thing out before it takes hold of my mm -hmm. body. And this is on a Monday night. And I thought that was unusual because Tuesday I was actually feeling more sick, even though I had done my usual thing Wednesday, a little bit more sick Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning, I'm lying in bed and I was living by myself and, um, I thought I'm going to die. Mm. I, I I was so sick. I was sicker than I had ever been. So I did the intelligent thing that anybody would do. I called my favorite healer. Mm -hmm. and I said, I think I'm going to die. And he looked in on me long distance and he said, you have to, I could help you, but you have to promise me that you do exactly what I tell you to do. I said, anything. He said, call 911 immediately. <laughs> Wow. so and I couldn't I said you called because really I was I was fading yeah. so 
the uh, paramedics come. They had to break down my door. I couldn't get out of bed. They wow. asked what hospital I wanted to go to. I whispered, Evanston. And, and they commiserated. It was about 11 minutes away. They didn't think I would live the 11 minutes. Wow. So they um, got me in the ambulance. They got me to this little hospital around the corner, St. Francis. And um, they... I went into the emergency room and they started putting tubes and monitors and every orifice and every, I mean, it, it was bad. My blood pressure, by the way, was 52 over 28. Wow. Which is incompatible with life. Yeah. And, um, and they're rushing around trying to save my life. And I started dying. Wow. And the reason why I knew I was dying is because when my eyes were open, I could see everybody rushing around trying to save my life. And when my eyes were closed, I could also see everybody rushing around trying to save my life, but mm -hmm. I saw this most amazing thing. You know how we say there are no mistakes in the universe? I saw there were no mistakes in the universe because I saw that there was this divine light. It was like a celestial light mm -hmm. that was guiding the hands of the nurses and of the doctors wow. and making everything happen like the cogs on a fine tuned watch. For example, this uh, one nurse, she she was hanging up an IV bag and she fumbled it and she dropped it on the gurney and everybody like gave her, da you know, shot daggers at her with their eyes like you clumsy fool, you know, this woman's dying and you drop mm -hmm. the IV bag. But I saw that when she bent down to pick it up, her head moved away from a monitor and another nurse across the room went oh, and went and made an adjustment that probably saved my life. Ah, and I just saw how everything worked together. And then what happened, which was even more amazing, was that my um, my former husband, who was still my best friend and still is, had arrived. And because my healer had told him where I was, and it didn't look good. And they, people were kind of telling him what was going on and that it didn't look good. It turned out that I had... Um, you know what a sepsis is when you have a, yeah, a yeah, yeah, bacteria yeah. in your blood. Yeah. I had just gotten back from India and I actually had two foreign bacteria in my blood. Oh, wow. And you have about a 50% chance of living when you have one. Yeah. I had two. Anyway, so I, I've always been an overachiever. So <laughs> they they had said to Fred that it didn't look good. And I looked over and I saw these tears rolling down his cheeks. And as he was sitting there with the tears, a nurse comes over to him, puts her hand on his shoulder. And I saw this in this place between life and death. And she said, don't worry, she's going to be fine. And I saw the words, she's going to be fine, come out of her mouth. And they were accompanied by this rainbow kind of pinky light. I say it was like my little pony rainbow, like did it? Yeah. And this, she's going to be fine. The words went into my body. And gave me my strength back. Wow. And every cell I like came back to life. Wow. And I'm like, what the heck? The your word is your wand. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be added unto you. I, I your words have dominion over life and death. All of the things that I had been teaching for decades, I saw it to be true. And then yeah. the doctor came in, looked at the monitor, and said, this really gruff voice, get that blood pressure up or we're going to lose her. And when he said, we're going to lose her, the words came out of his mouth, accompanied by this like brown gray gunk. It even smelled, it smelled like a swamp. Mm. We're going to lose her. It went into my body and it took my strength away. Mm. Wow. So I am lying there and I made a deal with God. I said, I get it, God. I get that what I've been teaching all these years is the truth, that your word is your wand. And I promise you, if you let me live, I will tell everybody this experience so that they know how powerful their words are, not only about themselves and their thoughts, because believe it or not, I could see the thoughts of people in the room as well. And yeah. I thought I saw that they were even more powerful, just like an atom is more powerful than, than a molecule and the electrons are more powerful than the atom. The thoughts, which are subtler, were, were even more powerful than the words. And I made, you're going to love this. I made one other deal with God at the moment. Yeah. I said, and I promise I will never say anything that I don't want to manifest 
ever again if you let me live, including about my children. Because at the moment when I was dying, of course, I was thinking about my kids. And I was yeah. about how I say, oh, my son, you know, he forgets everything, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah. and my daughter, she's so crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, th yeah. these aren't the things I say, but I said a lot of things about my kids. And at that moment, I realized that every time I said something about them, it was creating it. Yeah, I saw that in that space between life and death. So I promised God I would never again say anything I don't want to manifest. So the good news is I lived. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the second piece of good news is that I've been good. I've kept that promise probably yeah. about 99% of the time. Yeah, I was going to say, there's got to be at least one little, <laughs> but, but. But I love that. And I think that, you know, we have to be so careful guarding our minds. Like you said, you know, when you're sitting with people that are your age and they're complaining about aches and pains, you get up and leave. Like for me, if there's a show that, you know, somebody's watching and it's like super negative or violent or whatever, I, I don't watch it. Like if I stay in the room, I might just, you know, put on my, my headphones and watch something else on on my phone, but I don't allow that in. I don't, uh, and, and I know some people, oh, you're silly, you're overdoing it, but I just don't do that. I don't want things in my mind because my mind is my creative force that are violent. I don't want things in my mind that, you know, are harmful. I don't want things in my mind that are negative. And, and, and I, I mean, I get, I do get people, oh, come on, you know, loosen up. But I, I mean, I'm pretty loose in many areas, but that's one that you have to be super careful about because I, I mean, I remember watching, um, my wife was watching this show, uh, Game of Thrones, right? We hadn't seen it. And then there was, oh, you got to watch it. And, and, and so I'm, I'll, I'll watch one with her. And I remember like this guy is, killing this other guy by squeezing his head till his you know <laughs> pops and then i go to sleep and i can't sleep all night then i'm having nightmares and i'm like come on like why did you let yourself watch that for right so that was like the last time i think i watched something like super violent and i'm like no i'm not going to do it anymore you know there's actually research on that too and yeah. there is a um a uh, clinical investigator at Vanderbilt University. Yeah. And her name is, I know her first name's Hillary. I think it's Tyndall or Trindle. Yeah. But she, in her research, she talks about what she calls the improbable power of just being optimistic. Yeah. And in one massive study, 97 thousand women who filled out questionnaires for the National Institutes of Health, um, Women's Health Initiative, and women who scored higher on optimism, being helpful, uh, being hopeful about the future and not letting themselves dwell on negativity, yeah. they showed significantly lower rates of heart disease, cancer, and early death. And yeah, um, so one of the things that, that I teach in, in my body of work is how to be positive in a negative world because people say it's not possible to be positive look at what's going on but you and i we got to share that with people right. because right. again if you saw the movie what the bleep when you think negative thoughts you are actually putting negativity into the world and that's the last thing our world needs right now right right and so how do you look how do you look back now on that experience that near-death experience because you know, we say thoughts create, uh, that needed to happen, right? I mean, for you to know to the level of truth that you know now, and and so you don't probably look at it as like a terrible experience. You look at it as like one of the best learning experiences of your entire life, right? Absolutely. Again, there are no mistakes in the universe. Yeah. And um, I mean, how many friends do you have that had cancer or had some kind of yeah. disease and they they say it was the most, it was the best thing that ever happened right. to them because they changed the way they thought, they changed the way they eat, that they started appreciating their loved ones so much more. So I actually teach people that when usually we give thanks, you know, we should have gratitude, usually right. we have gratitude when something good happens, but I tell people have gratitude when something bad happens because it's not really bad. And yeah. if you, the quicker you say, I say, thank you, God, the quicker we say, thank you, 
then the more quickly we open ourselves up to the gift and there is a gift in everything. Yeah, and that, so that, that is, and yeah, the, and the quicker you do that, like it's easier to do it, you know, two years later, we go, oh, that really shifted my path. But if you do it in the moment, you say, thank you. And, and, and I, I teach this to my kids, I, you know, you got to find something in there that you can really milk. So there's something in there that's a huge, huge opportunity, a huge advantage, a huge lesson, even though it doesn't look, look like it because you didn't want this thing to happen it's nudging you or or you know knocking you in a different direction or making you think more creatively or or uh getting you to read a book you never would have writ read had you not had this happen so really cool now you had all this success and then you decided you you became a mother and you decided that you were going to raise your children and you did an amazing job you have incredible children and then you you said, all right, I'm back. And and you're creating the same level of success again. Like talk to people about that because that's something I think, especially women, when they have children, like they're really concerned, like, well, if I'm out of the workforce for, you know, my maternity leave or whatever, it'll be a disadvantage. You don't have any beliefs like that. You believe you can do whatever you want, come back, you know, make it happen again. Uh, but talk us through this a little bit. Gosh, there's so many things I could say about it. But one thing I'm going to say, why I was able to leave the world of transformational speaking for 20 years and come back and again, out of the shoot, create a million dollar launch within a year yeah. is for one of the main principles that I teach about success. And that is to treat everyone is the most important person in the world. Mm. At any given moment, the person standing in front of you is the most important person in the world. Because, you know, to us, we are. Mm -hmm. So every person deserves to feel that way. But I'll ask you this, Tom, have you ever been in a situation where you're sharing with somebody something that's really important to you? And they're looking around the room to see if there's somebody more important to talk to, talk to than you? Ever have that experience? Sure. Right? Yeah, sure. Okay. We all have. Because people don't realize that, again, when we treat that person in front of us as the most important person in the world, we're doing God's work on earth. Right. If we do God's work, then God will find you that more important person to make the business deal with mm -hmm. or do the endorsement for your book. Yeah. And um, instead of us thinking that we could not treat that person with respect and look around the room. But I'll tell you a story of when I was teaching Yes to Success back in the 80s and this little girl, adorable, she was maybe five foot tall and bouncy little college student. She came up to me after one of my Yes to Success seminars and she said, I want to work for you. I want to work for you. I said, you know, aren't you in college? And she said, I'm going to quit. <laughs> so I'm going to work for you. She was in graduate school. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, who's this little bouncy little, you know, college student. And, you know, I'm the siesta success. I gave her my full attention. I listened to every single word she said. I didn't look around the room because yeah. she is this piece of God in human form. And that little girl whose name is Marcy Shymoff. Yeah. Uh, went on to become the number one nonfiction female author of all time, selling 16 million chicken soup books and also happy for no reason, love for no reason. I hired her. She did leave college. She became my assistant. And um, and she was incredible because she's so creative. But but more than that, when I came out on the other side of tour, and then, you know, the story, I had my first child and I was supposed to go back. I actually had all of these uh, speaking engagements. I had a promoter in Singapore who mm -hmm. had like all of Southeast Asia set up with speaking engagements for yeah. me. And I had the baby and I thought, new passion. Yeah. And I became a full-time mom at home for 20 years. Wow. But when... Because, you know, we're all put on earth for a purpose. Yeah. And if you take out, you know, a year to be with your mom while she's dying or two years to go hold AIDS babies in Uganda or maybe to work on a political campaign. What you were put on earth to do is not going to go away. If you follow your heart, it's going to be there more strongly for you yeah. when you follow your heart. So I follow my heart and I was about to have my own daytime TV talk show when mm -hmm. I decided to, um, by major, major Hollywood 
group yeah. of producers. But I took one look at that baby and I thought, you know, I could have a TV show anytime, but I can only be with my baby while she's a I baby. Love that. I love that. And then, yeah. and then my son, who was born three years later, yeah. and that's not that everybody should stay home and be a mom at home right. because my kids loved later on when I went out and gave speeches and it's mm -hmm. like, hey, that's my mom. Yeah. But back to that, that wonderful Marcy Shimoff, when I came out the other side, when it was uh, 20 years later, mm -hmm. and by the way, the reason I was still, you know, wanting to read Harry Potter to my kids when they were 20 and 17. <laughs> <laughs> like, mom, we can read ourselves. <laughs> but our dear friend Janet Atwood said to me, Debbie, when are you going to stop pretending that your kids still need you and yeah. get back on the stage because yeah. the world needs you, right? Yeah. yeah. And to me, it was like, I, I didn't think my kids needed me anymore, but yeah. I knew that I needed them because to me, one, I love you, mommy. Right. With more than a thousand standing ovations. Yeah. So it's like, I loved being yeah. a mom, but yeah. I still am. And they still need me and they're still yeah. calling me and now they're in yeah. their 30s. But anyway, so Janet kicked my butt. I got back on the stage and then Marcy called me and said, I have this idea to start a company called Your Year of Miracles. And you're the only person I want to teach it with. Awesome. And we started the company together. And our first launch, which was just a few months after that, was a million dollar launch. Wow. And, but she thought of me yeah. because I treated her with such respect when she was a little college student. So yeah. you never know who that is standing in front of you. And even if they don't turn out to be a Marcy Shimoff or Janet Atwood, who is also one of my uh, assistants in the early days, it's just doing God's work on earth and treating the person yeah. in front of you. Remind yourself as a Muslim. I love it. Yeah. And my wife's, my wife's a lot like a lot like you in that regard too. When, when she had, she was chief operating officer of a chain of health clubs. And then we had kids, she actually retired at, you know, very young age in her, in her thirties. And, and then, but ha, uh, had a business, uh, she, she got into yoga, became one of the top yoga teachers, actually probably in the world. She was the fitness instructor of the world, like uh, two years ago out of, you know, the whole world. And, but, but really spent a lot of time with the kids knowing that there's no scarcity of opportunities. Uh, you came out of the gate with a million dollar lunch with, without, you know, being in the business at all for 20 years. Now, a lot of that was because you have this elevated thinking process. Not everyone's built it up to that level where they can create that quickly and efficiently with their thoughts. I'm not saying, again, this is not for everybody, but this is what's possible. This is the promise of what Deborah's talking about and what, you know, we talk about in the Breakthrough Code is that we are able to create. And it's not like Deborah didn't to do a million dollar launch. She didn't email a million people. She created it with her mind and opportunity came. She was able to, and there's work involved, obviously, but most of it, most of what we create, especially at the level that you're at, and I like to think that I'm at, most of it is created with our minds. The people and opportunities that come to me are rarely something that I've instigated. Uh, even, and, and I, I love how you said, treat the person in front of you with respect and love. I saw that in my grandfather back in the day. He was uh, a well-to-do person, but I remember he lived in this apartment complex. Uh, it was uh, this luxury apartments in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And he treated the doorman with as much respect as he treated anybody. And they loved him as the other people just like, it was, oh, it's a doorman, but he loved them and he would tip them generously. And, and I just remember, man, my grandfather's really cool. He treats everybody with so much love. And then uh, one time I was, I used to do, uh, teach part of Wealth Mastery for Tony Robbins a long time ago. It was after I left helping to run his company. I was head of sales and marketing, but I was, I do it like, four times a year. So it was a small thing. It was apart from my regular company, but I remember being in London and we were staying, I was, we were doing a big event for about 4,000 people. I was the, the, you know, one of the main speakers there. And we were staying on this hotel that was a big cruise liner, but it was docked. And so I'm getting on the elevator and we're going down and there's two gentlemen in Middle Eastern attire and they're coming down with me. And I didn't know if they were, you know, going to the 
place I was going. I didn't think they were actually. And I just said, you know, how are you guys doing today? And because I'm always curious, I always want to know about other human beings. That's why I, kind of what happened when we sat down, like you were interested in me, I was interested in you. And and they said, oh, we're going. Uh, no, I said, uh, I said, how are you guys doing? They go, good. I said, uh, where are you guys from? And they said, Dubai. Now, I, I, this is a long time ago. I hadn't even heard of Dubai. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. And I said, where are you going? They go, um, they said, we're going to this Tony Robbins thing. I said, well, I'm headed that way too. I didn't tell them what I did. I said, you know, I'll walk with you. And I get in there and we separate. And then, you know, I'm the main speaker that day. And so I see them on the way back and they're like, hey, we're really glad we bumped into you. You know, we didn't know you're going to be the speaker, but we want to bring you to Dubai. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that sounds great. And, and, and they said, you know, we'll send us whatever your requirements are. And I remember, you know, sending them and going, you know, I doubt they'll follow through. I mean, actually, I did let that thought in my head, but they did. And that chance meeting on an elevator turned into over many, you know, I don't know how many millions or, but, but it, it, it turned into, cause I've been over to the Middle East now, like 17 times. And that type thing happens all the time. And so I love like, stop looking for, okay, who do I need to impress? Love the person right in front of you. And then you will have the right people come to you. I love that. That's amazing. And I want to point out something else about you. See, you are a vibration for success and happiness and prosperity. See, and even though, and, and again, it's not like we're perfect. Like that's why I said 99% yeah. of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had the random thought, oh, I doubt if they'll ever call me back. But that one random thought did not override that right. you are a magnet for success. And that's yeah. what people have to change. And one of the things that I that I recommend people do, there is a little pamphlet called the seven day mental diet by oh, Emmett yeah. Fox. I've seen right? it. Yeah, Emmett Fox, yeah. And it was, it's like from 1928 or something, yeah. but he tells you how to go on the seven day mental diet. And if you can make it through seven days yeah. of no negativity about yourself, about others, about, and most people can't make it through seven hours, <laughs> yeah. on seven days. Yeah. But I have to tell you again, in all transparency, I started teaching that in Yes to Success in 1980, yeah. and it took me over 30 years yeah. to get through all seven days yeah That's 30 years but if people would just do it, it it's like a cleanse it's like when yeah. you fast physically you cleanse and then you 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 feel like a completely different human being yeah if you do the mental diet which is harder than any physical fast i love it Sunday mental diet you can get it on amazon it yeah. will change your life yeah i love that and i actually was going to write a book years ago I came up with this title, The Mental Diet for Success. And, and then I, I didn't even know about that book. And I'm like, oh, there's already something out there on it. But my, my concept was that, you know, whatever we are thinking is like a diet. There's junk food. There's junk thoughts, right? There's nourishing creative uh, foods and there's nourishing creative thoughts. And so a really beautiful concept. And you're right. It is, it is very challenging to 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 eliminate all that stuff and really think positive and 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 resourceful and loving and and unconditional loving for everybody no matter how they're treating you but it is incredibly powerful hey speaking of pamphlets i know you've got a couple ebooks that uh, i would love for you to share uh, with people how to get them tell us quickly what they are and then how can people get these ebooks from you yeah, well, interestingly, we didn't get to the fact that I also teach anti-aging, but well, no, we'll do that. We'll do that right after this. Oh, yeah. okay. Because yeah. I said good yeah. news is, is that I have five tips for turning back the hands of time. I have a book called Ancient and Modern Secrets to Lifelong Radiance. Okay. And people can get that at Yes to Success, which is the name of my company, yes to success.com forward slash ageless book. And okay. it's a bunch of tips on, again, how to turn back the hands of time. And then I have another ebook, free, Five Secrets to a Life of True Success. And that is also yes to success.com. And that's just forward slash gift. Nice. Beautiful. And I know those books are going to be incredibly valuable for everybody. Make sure you check those out. Yes to success. And you can replay this if you, if you need the, if you're in the car or something like that, and you're going to do it later. 
replay this part of the interview and, and make sure you get those eBooks from, from Deborah. Uh, they're awesome. Deborah, we kind of teased it a little bit. You're going to tell us one or two things we can do to slow down or, or prevent aging at least somewhat, right? So what can we do? Well, I will rattle off a few tips Okay. because I am so, you know, I, I'm really a fanatic about people taking um, advantage of these tips because aging the way people think uh, it's going to supposed to happen. Like when you're 72, you're not supposed to look like this or when yeah. you're, you know, you're not supposed to have any aches and pains, which I don't. Yeah. It doesn't happen by chance. I mean, heredity is one thing, genetics, but yeah. I'm going to give you, I'll give you three quick tips. First is okay. diet. If you only do one thing in the area of diet for better health and longevity, stop eating white refined sugar. Yeah. We talked about that. The first yeah, time. Yeah, I remember talking about yeah, that. First time we talked about it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And with your gorgeous life. And it is the worst offender when it comes to brain inflammation. And inflammation is the main cause of your brain atrophying and aging too fast. White refined sugar and foods that act the same in your system, like refined carbs, white bread, white pasta, it causes the inflammation that slows down the communication between your brain neurons. And yeah. that's what causes you to feel dull and forgetful. And it's serious because if you, um, as the cells start dying from doing things like eating white sugar, yeah. then it plays a significant role in Alzheimer's. And also yeah. in your body, other degenerative diseases like yeah. diabetes, arthritis. Okay. And don't substitute Splenda or NutraSweet or anything with aspartame worse than white yeah. sugar, but yeah. it is bad. Okay. In the realm of exercise, there is compelling research that's concluded that two exercise methods slow down the aging process better than any others by preventing cellular aging. And one is aerobics. Mm -hmm. And the other, which was number one, was HIT, high intensity interval mm -hmm. training, very <laughs> high burst of right. intensity, you know, cardio, yeah. followed by equal or longer periods of rest. There was a study done, uh, printed in the European Heart Journal, and researchers examined a plethora of exercise modalities over a six month period. And the participants were, what they found was that high intensity interval training actually increased telomer activity and you know wow. telomeres yeah. are the nucleotide sequences found at the end of our chromosomes and when they shorten aging occurs and high intensity interval training and endurance training like yeah. you know aerobics increase telomere length more than anything else producing the anti-aging effect and can i give one more yeah, absolutely. Okay, one more, maybe two more. One more tip. <laughs> we all know we need enough sleep, but what most people don't know is that what is more important than how long you sleep is what time you sleep. Mm. Nobody knows this. Yeah. That we produce more human growth hormone, which is the anti-aging hormone referred to as HGH. Yeah. And it's in, in HGH is important for brain functioning. Again, aerobic endurance, immunity. HGH increases your skin elasticity. Oh, cool. And if, yeah. And if you're trying to lose weight, it stimulates fat burning. It mm. also increases muscle mass and bone density. And we can increase our HGH by a factor of fivefold, depending on our sleep habits. Wow. And what it is, is we produce five times as much HGH between the hours of people aren't going to like this 10 p.m. and midnight. That's perfect. I mean, we, we go to bed here about 9 p.m., believe it or not, and then get up and get up early. So perfect. And that's why you look so good. And your wife is so <laughs> stunning and so yeah. gorgeous. And basically, it's because our circadian rhythms are still mm -hmm. in tune from when there weren't electric lights and you right. went to bed when and the hgh started being produced sure. when you went to bed when the sun went down yeah exactly right so in the summer you could stay up a little bit later but by the time it's around midnight or in the summer maybe one o'clock our our hgh plummets and if yeah. you go to bed at one o'clock in the morning you have completely missed peak hgh production that's awesome. And hey, you want more of these tips? Get Deborah's book, the, the ebook that she's offered to give you. So tell us what's that address one more time? Yes to success. 
yes to success.com. Don't forget yeah. the .com forward slash ageless book, ageless ebook. I'm sorry, ageless ebook. Ageless ebook. Yeah. And the success one is yes to success.com forward slash gift. They're both fabulous. You are a gift. Thank you so much for being with us. You are amazing. Whenever I'm with you, I have so much fun and feed off your energy. So Deborah, lots of love to you. Keep keep working your magic. Keep helping so many people really create proactively with their thoughts, not just having their thoughts create something they don't want, but create what they do want. You've taught so many people that, and you truly, I said you're a gift. You are a gift to the world. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for everything you contribute to the world. You are also one of my favorite people and you are, you are so good and so kind. This is a guy who walks his talk. <laughs> thank you, Deborah, And thank you everybody for listening. If you enjoy the show, please tell your friends and make sure you subscribe. We were honored to have you here. Have an incredible day and make an incredible life.